Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Shumacast. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is... Angie, hello. And we have a special guest who we've never recorded with before. Never. J.D. DeMott. <laughs> Go into the podcast, woo! Go into the podcast, yeah. There's absolutely no reason why our first guest is someone that we've done countless hours of recording with before. Uh. Hey, guys. Hey. It's good to have you, J.D. Well, thank you. J.D., how are you? (laughs) I'm doing great. Do we need to walk you through what this podcasting thing is? Um, I'm pretty sure you're going to record video of me yes. talking to a microphone, watching yes. the yes. movie, right? You got it. You got it. Okay. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Awesome. You just put a little window up in the corner. <laughs> so, J.D., welcome to our Joel Schumacher podcast. And I have to ask, what are your feelings towards and history with Joel Schumacher? I've liked some of his things. Obviously, some things, not so much. I'm not going to be on the Batman episodes, as far as I know, nope. so those suck. I have fond memories of falling down. I remember St. Emil's Fire being fun. It's been a long while since I've watched that. Lost Boys, of course. I don't think I've seen too much of his more recent stuff. Never saw Phantom or Phone Booth or Tigerland or any of that stuff. I guess it's a mixed history, but I don't hate him. I do think he gets a little bit of a bad rap. I think he was trying to go for a campy vibe with the Batman films that was in line with the 60s Batman TV show, Mm -hmm. but I don't think it still worked at all. And I think they're pretty terrible films. (laughs) So yeah, I have mixed thoughts, but I'm looking forward to these podcasts. Today, we're covering the 1976 film Car Wash. And you'll start with you. Is Car Wash a film that you had ever seen before? I think I had at least seen some clips of it. Like, I want to say definitely George Carlin's scenes I had probably seen clips of somewhere. I don't know if I ever actually watched it all the way through before this, though. Definitely knew the song. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think we all know the song. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I was going to say, like, the only thing I ever heard is the song. So I didn't even realize what this film was until you were like, hey, watch this. I'm like, okay. <laughs> And yeah, I had never seen it before either. Again, it's one of those ones you always kind of heard about because I know it was kind of a big film when it came out for a while. But yeah, I'd never seen it. I think it was just a few years before my time. Mm. Just to open up the production notes, I got a nice couple of quotes here from Joel to get into the origins of the movie. He says, what happened was Art Linson and Gary Stromberg, the producers, went to go see Ned Tannen, who ran Universal, and they wanted to do a stage play called Car Wash. They wanted to build a car wash on stage and do a musical comedy. And then if that became a success, they would make that into a movie. Ned Tannen said that was the worst idea he had ever heard in his life. (laughs) (laughs) But he had read the script for Sparkle, and if they could get the writer, he might make a movie called Car Wash. And that's Mm. how the whole thing started. Interesting. Just imagine this, like, on stage with a car wash running and cars running through one by one. (laughs) I'm imagining this strange mix with, like, Gallagher shows where, like, if you're in the front row, you got to bring a raincoat because you're going to get splashed (laughs) by the soap bubbles and stuff. (laughs) Might be kind of fun. (laughs) It's an interesting concept that I would actually like to see someone try. And given that we've had this kind of resurgence of cult movies being redone for the stage, I would like to see Mm -hmm. someone try that. Anyways, going back to Joel... When I was asked if I wanted to do something called Car Wash, I had seen an African-American hooker on a Sunday morning strung out on drugs with a beer and a paper bag and a blonde wig trying to make a phone call outside a car wash. I realized that the car wash was a kind of place where you could have a lot happen. There's a lot of celebration of the downtrodden minority in car wash and how often people who have suffered use humor to get along. I also found a couple of nice quotes from Michael Schultz, where he just talked about how much he enjoyed working with Joel and how he wanted to always balance the humor and the seriousness. But anyways, just getting back into the production notes. So as stated, the film was produced by Art Linson and Gary Stromberg. 
Stromberg's only produced one other film, the wonderfully titled The Fish That Saved Pittsburgh, <laughs> which is a basketball movie, because that makes sense. Sure. But Linson went on to produce films including Fast Times at Ridgemont High, The Untouchables, Dick Tracy, Heat, Lords of Dogtown, and the TV series Sons of Anarchy. So this was only his second film, but he went on to have a pretty good career. Mm. And this was the second film of director Michael Schultz. Now, Angie, had you ever heard of <laughs> Michael Schultz before? <laughs> Yes, I have a bit of a history with him, thanks to our old podcast, Monthly Midnight Movie Exchange. In general, I'm not so big a fan. I don't think it's anything to do with his directing. I just generally don't care for the scripts he seems to get involved with. <laughs> yeah. He started in the 70s directing for television, then broke into features with Cooley High, and this was his second film. He went on to make wonderful films like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. I do like that one, by the way. <laughs> Crush Groove and the two that we covered on the Monthly Midnight Movie Exchange, The Last Dragon and The Disorderlies. Yes. <laughs> that boy's are back. <laughs> And while his feature career kind of cooled, he has since gone back into television, and he's still a very prominent director in TV to this day. I mean, even mm -hmm. recently, he's been doing episodes of Arrow and Once Upon a Time, so very prominent TV director. Mm -hmm. That's all I've got for production notes. I don't have a synopsis for this film because this is one of those films where it's literally a day in the life of the people working at a car wash. The movie begins yeah. at the beginning of the day. The movie ends at the end of the day. Everyone comes, does their jobs, goes home, and it's just all these little vignettes and character pieces and adventures. As all these people's lives interact on a daily basis. All these various customers come in and out of their lives as the cars go through. So I think as we go through our discussion, we'll just hit on some of the individual character stories. But otherwise, I didn't really find a way to do a synopsis on this one. It would end up being so ridiculously long. You either do like two sentences or you like do the whole thing. There's no good way to really summarize most of it. No. I'd basically just be checklisting each character. And I think it'd be better mm -hmm. to just do that as we discuss. Right, right. So I will ask, Angie, do you recommend Car Wash? I'm so on the fence in terms of recommendations. Ultimately, it didn't really work for me. I like a story with a little more of a focused plot that has a stronger point, whereas this one kind of meanders between different things for a long time and then tries to have a point at the end. And it's like, you didn't earn this. I'm sorry. But there's a lot of really good actors in this. There's a lot of little interesting bits and pieces. I don't know that I would necessarily call it a really funny comedy, but it's not bad either. It's just sort of there. I don't know. Like, I wouldn't blindly recommend it to anyone, but there are certainly people that I know who I think would enjoy it. JD, do you recommend Car Wash? I'm going to mirror a lot of what Angie just said. What I look for in the movies often are usually plot and characters. And while there's a lot of actors here, I don't know if the characters are that fleshed out. There are some really interesting bits, a few jokes that made me laugh. They're definitely of the time. As a whole, it just didn't quite come together for me. I'm glad I watched it. And I think it actually kind of made me want to watch some more 70s films because it's an era that I really haven't watched a whole lot of. But this by itself, it's not terrible, but it didn't really wow me. No, mm -hmm. I can't recommend it. I love this movie. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I was going to say, are we shocked? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, I hear what you all are saying, but I do disagree with a film needing to have a through line. You can just have a film where it's set up a camera and just show all these various lives that go by it. Yeah, I'm not saying it needs it. I'm just saying that's what I personally look for and prefer. I'm wondering if part of it helps that this reminds me a lot of where I work and the people that I work with, because <laughs> I work in a shipping warehouse. And it's literally just every day, all these people come together, you do your work, you have all these very various bits of their lives intersecting without like following any of them home and getting into their lives. It's just people at work at a job. I really liked it. <laughs> I thought the characters were really interesting and had a lot of good hooks to them. I really enjoyed the editing. I thought it was shot well. I thought the music was good. I thought the way it jumped around the various vignettes, the way it bounced from like, let's just stop and focus on a scene or let's have a montage of a bunch of scenes wrapped around the music and the voice on the radio. I just thought it was a really, really well-made film. It was a really captivating story. I was hooked from beginning to end. I loved it. Let's start with Franklin Najaya is TC. He's the aspiring comic book artist who is always rushing off to the phone because he wants to win concert tickets so he can impress the waitress who works across the street who has no interest in him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have issues with TC. Yeah. <laughs> 
I kind of liked him at first. You know, he's a comic book guy. I'm a comic book guy. He's trying to keep up beat. But his treatment towards the waitress, it is toxic masculinity. It's that whole, well, you're not going to do any better than me, so you might as well settle. I just found that repulsive, especially since she does give in to him at the end of the film. And Mm -hmm. it's just like, I just find that whole plot, like, it just soured me on his character after that. Yeah, it's pretty typical, I think, for the time period of, like, you know, the kind of guy who's just going to tirelessly pursue a girl and that's going to be enough. Right. But it has definitely aged very poorly to watch it now and be like, ugh. I mean, like, the fact that his superhero idea was essentially a pun of Superfly. Yeah. That's really cute. I like that ambition. I like the way he kept bringing up the character and he really wanted it to be the black Superman. And how he wanted to be the character. Right. Yeah. That's really cute. But then they also, I guess, because maybe he was one of the younger guys, they stick this love story on him. And it's like, yeah, I could totally do without that part of it and be fine. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Like, I was kind of digging it. Whenever you get frustrated, he just make that sound. (laughs) Yeah. That's his like way of I can get past this like I'm gonna be a superhero I thought that was great but the whole ending just really turned me off on him right yeah I think it would have worked a lot better if it had just been like, they're already a couple, they both like each other, but she's just frustrated because you never take me anywhere. We never go out and do anything. And that's where he's kind of built this fixation on, I need to get these tickets so I can take her out somewhere. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing of trying to almost shame her into dating him. Yep. Right. They had been out on one date, she's not interested, and he just won't shut up. And he just, he's calling her at work. He's showing up at work. Mm -hmm. It is very toxic. And it does strike me that Joel Schumacher, we've seen this with Sparkle too, he doesn't write young relationships very well. No. Even Sticks and Sparkle in that one. Right. There's a lot of him just pushing her and pressuring her. Exactly. Her falling into it. And I'm wondering if that's just because his relationship history is completely different. (laughs) Maybe. Or like I said, I feel like that was kind of a typical thing for a long time in storytelling, that it was like, as long as you just kept trying, you were going to get that girl. It's a very 1950s Wally Cleaver type of, Mm -hmm. that's how you get the girl son type of thing. But again, I'm wondering if that's just the pop culture that Joel Schumacher grew up with when his relationship experience was the sex, drugs, rock and roll of the fashion industry in the 60s. Right. He doesn't do wholesome very well. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I mean, TC, my one issue with the Fly character is, oh, would he be opening himself up to a lawsuit from Archie? (laughs) Because they had the Red Circle character, the Fly, going back to the 1940s. (laughs) If we set aside the whole wages thing, which we Mm -hmm. shouldn't because that that is some poor writing. I just really like that he's so exuberant and energetic. And again, yeah, how he's such a dork. You know, it's like, I think there's a bomb. He's like, (laughs) I hear the call to action. And my God. God, is that an epic fro. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) It's always fun when you get the tiny energetic guy with a gigantic fro. Yeah. But yeah, he's just such a relatable goofball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wish that there was more of a you're taking the wrong approach to the relationship story or that their relationship was different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like him. I just don't like how that relationship is done. Right. Somebody would have like, while they were all in the cafe, dude, just back off, would you? You know, Mm -hmm. yeah, that would have been nice. Or just have somebody say like, just give her a little bit of space, then see what happens. Or she could have heard on the radio that he had won and maybe she could have like thought, oh, maybe he does have something going on or at least least something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the way it works, it just, ooh, I don't like that trope at all yeah Mm -hmm. i'm glad that's a very small part of the movie but it's still there yeah right and then let's jump to james spinks as hippo (laughs) who might surprise you to learn is an overweight person (laughs) but you know he's just kind of jauntily always around he's got his tiny little motor scooter he's always just kind of slouching around with his little portable radio until he gives the portable radio to the prostitute in exchange for hooking up with the prostitute (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. There's not much to his character. He's more just a comedic character. No, not really. I think this is that era where having a fat guy <laughs> is just all the comedy you need. That's your character. Yeah. Right. I did enjoy, just because it was just so screwball ridiculous, the whole, there's the mad bomber, the bottle bomber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They think this weird little guy is this guy on the news who's been leaving these exploding soda bottles around. Mm-hmm. They steal the bottle, spill it, and it turns out it's just full of piss that he's taken to his doctor, for example. Well, like when him and TC were like pursuing him and like Hippo's like up against the wall and he's like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> like, that well, was he's pretty funny. And TC's like basically burrowing into Hippo to hide. <laughs> and they're doing the classic, the short skinny guy, the big fat guy. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not even just the wall. They're doing it against the window. Like into the office. (laughs) 
Hippo was right. like not hidden at all. And he got TC's fro like popping out from the bottom. And it's just like, I wish they had flipped the camera up to the other side just so you could see it from that end. But it still was a hilarious scene. Yeah, mm-hmm. I thought that scene was better than the entirety of Disorderlies. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> That's not saying much. No, it's not. <laughs> The next character is one of the good serious characters, Ivan Dixon as Lonnie. He's kind of the heart of the film. Mm. He's the kind of gruff guy with a stogie in his mouth. He's an ex-con who's on parole. He's trying to turn his life around. He's still worried about going back to jail. He's got his two kids who keep visiting him and he loves his Mm. kids and he kind of watches out for everyone. And even though he's frustrated with his life, he's actually become kind of very entrusted with, he's always the one who locks up. He's the one who goes through the money and puts together receipts at the end. He's the guy who's kind of become this trusted figure, even though he has this dark past to him. He was the kind of character that I'd feel like if they had maybe dumped some of the goofy screwball haven't aged very well moments and spent a little more time developing his character, I probably would have been a lot more invested in him. The scenes that he's in, he's great. It's just maybe a little bit of an odd shift from all of the goofy stuff in between for me sometimes. I liked his story a lot. It just seemed to almost come out of nowhere compared to everything else. I thought he was probably one of the highlights of the film. I thought his performance was great. He gets a few comic moments, but for the most part, he's played pretty straight. And that does seem a little bit atonal with the rest of the film, but I just thought he was just so good. I really didn't care. He plays off really well with one other character I'm sure we'll get to in a little bit here. But that moment towards the end, he sells that. Like you said, he's the heart of the film. Everybody respects him. I think even the owner respects him, even though there's still that class element and quite likely racial element to it. But he's not the leader of the gang, but he's like the one that everybody turns to. And I like that. He's the father of the gang. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is what's interesting. The film is almost an hour of pure comedy and then kind of more poignant stuff starts to creep in in the last half hour. Right. I should point out, I did read Joel Schumacher's screenplay for it, which I I think was a fantastic screenplay. And I think Joel is a really great writer and I wish he would write more. Joel, go back to writing. You're really good at it. (laughs) Almost all of that script is in this film. There's a few cut bits. There were a few bits that were added, mostly improv stuff here and there. But what's interesting is some of it's been restructured. Like the main scenes of Ivan Dixon is while you have all this stuff going on at the car wash, you have the scene where his parole officer visits. And even though the parole officer is a nice guy who's just doing his job and just checking up on him regularly like he's supposed to, Every time he comes, Lonnie is terrified of, my boss is going to find out, I'm going to lose my job. I'm pretty sure the boss would already know by now, but he's just worried about everything crashing down. Then you have the scene where his kids visit and the daughter gives him the picture she drew and you really see Mm -hmm. how much he cares about turning his life around. And then the big finale, which we'll get to in a second, but those scenes were spread out more in the script. The Pearl officer came in the first half hour, the kids were at the hour point, and then you have the finale. Whereas in the finished film, they kind of squished that all down in the last half hour. Yeah, I feel like having it more spread out probably would have felt a little better for me. And I know from the Michael Schultz interview that I read that he did have a lot of conflicts with the studio where he wanted it to be like the script was, where you have your drama and you have your humor and the two Mm -hmm. are constantly moving in and out of each other and playing off of each other. But the studio wanted more of a comedy. Okay. And so there were other more poignant scenes that he was forced to cut. Nothing too major, but just some moments here and there. And then like other scenes that he had to move around and he really had to fight to get the ending. Hmm. Okay. That is the ending that Joel wrote. And Michael really had to fight to get that film. And in fact, they shot most of this film in sequence, in chronological sequence. And he was just trying to basically stall until they got to the ending (laughs) so that he could force the studio to have to use that ending. So I know that there were conflicts that I think might have ended up with why things were kind of moved around in the film. I still like it. I still think it plays well. I still think it's nice to have this hour where you just settle in as a comedy. And then as you get to know these people, then you start to see a bit more of the serious side. I wish you could get a little more of that even. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Just a weird technical question. Did it seem to y'all like they had to maybe re-record a lot of his lines in post? The whole film felt like it was 80-yard, at least for good chunks of it. They did because they filmed it in an actual car wash with street traffic around them. 
So they did yeah. have to do a lot of ADR in this movie. And it seemed like maybe just because his voice is so deep, just a lot of his lines had that like hiss quality, like it's ADR rather than live. And it might also just be the print of the film might have had just this kind of general hiss to it too. Well, it's like I noticed it more when he was speaking than anybody else. Well, I mean, yeah, he might just have a lower yeah. voice that they had to bump up even more. Right. Well, and there was like one scene where like the owner comes out and he's like talking. To, he's like, hey, Lonnie. And this, you hear this voice is like, hey, boss. Right. Like Lonnie's not on screen at that time. It just felt so artificial. It really mm-hmm. did take me out of the moment. I think that's just a lot of 70s ADR has that quality because they weren't mm-hmm. able to finesse it as well as they can nowadays. Right. Sure. Yeah. And also, I think he just naturally has that very distinct low gruff voice. Yes. You know, <laughs> which surprised me when I first heard it. Yeah, yeah, it's a great voice. He totally could do voice acting if he hasn't. Oh, apparently yeah. he has. And he did a lot of TV. Oh, okay. He's since passed away. A lot of this cast has since passed away. But sure. He did quite a bit. Apparently he was a very prominent actor in the 60s, especially in the theater scene. Okay. But yeah, it's a voice that catches you by surprise. But then again, as the movie goes along, you kind of settle into it more. Mm-hmm. And again, I was worried as I was watching it. I'm like, oh, they're cutting out all of his character bits. And then oh, as you get yeah. to the final half, I was like, <laughs> oh, there they are. <laughs> One thing I did want to mention, because I just brought it up, this was filmed at the Robert Taylor's Car Wash, which was on Rampart Boulevard and West 6th Street in Los Angeles, California. So this was actually filmed in downtown Los Angeles. Mm. And then the Dog House, which is the diner, which was also across the street in Los Angeles, California. Oh, okay. They just actually found this corner with a diner and a car wash, and they just filmed it there. And the deluxe car wash was going to be renovated and has actually now since been torn down. Mm, figures. They did not even block traffic. They had cars driving by, <laughs> so they had to redo a lot of audio. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so then we get Bill Duke as formerly known as Dwayne, but is now going by the name Abdullah. He mm-hmm. is more that voice of the young radical. He has a lot of anger. He's kind of drawn towards a lot of the more we're going to rise and, and revolt and have a revolution, that philosophy. And he's kind of a bitter guy throughout the film. And of course, he has the ending where he's fired and then comes back at the end and tries to hold up Lonnie to give him all the money that they made that day. And Lonnie refuses to back down and talks him out of it, takes the gun, they embrace and just venting the frustration of being stuck in a rut basically in your life and not really knowing where you're going or where you want to go. And JD, what do you think about Abdullah? I thought Abdullah was fantastic. I thought it was a great performance again. The ending between him and Lonnie, I really wish we had gotten more of that in this film, to be Mm -hmm. honest, because I thought these two characters were really, really good together. I just, like, you never really know what's going on with Abdullah. Like, we know he's late to work. He's kind of meeting up with these shady characters. Yeah, Mm -hmm. but you never really know. Like, we know he's talking about revolution and all this stuff, but we don't know. Is he planning some big revolution or is he just getting into, you know, let's say some not so legal crime activity type stuff Mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, and it's not clear. I mean, the ending shows that he's at least open to the idea of robbing the store. (laughs) But the ending with him and Lonnie where they just hug and cry it out. Out and it's just he doesn't know what's going on. I think he's waiting for that big revolution to happen and it just isn't happening yet. And he's starting to get jaded about it. Like he kind of expected this whole thing to have gotten a lot further than they are at this point in the 70s. Mm-hmm. It says a lot without saying a lot. And I thought that was one of the best parts of this film. That's interesting because I feel like we kind of needed more. I mean, I I agree it's a fantastic performance, but for most of the film, I'm like, am I supposed to think this guy is like a bad dude and he's going about this the wrong way? Am I supposed to feel sympathetic toward him? I felt like the film just didn't, I don't know if it was afraid to make a stance about the whole thing or what, but it was like, is he supposed to be the butt of a joke or not? And then, you know, we finally get to that end and it's a great, great scene. But once again, it was like I felt a little confused because it was like, well, you had him as the butt of a joke for a while and now you want me to care about him. And it's like, all right. But fortunately, like I said, the scene in and of itself is just fantastic. Both the characters together are just really great. I was divided on him, I guess, is the best way to describe it. What I like about his character is, again, I see this at my job. I work in a shipping warehouse where it's not the best job in the world. It actually pays pretty decently, but it's still just a lot of grunt work. It's a lot of labor work. And there's a lot of people who are just comfortable with it, go with the flow with it. There's also a lot of people who, like we see with TC and some of the others, are always dreaming of bigger and better things. This is just a stepping stone. I'm going to go off and become famous, or I have this other business plan that I'm going to do that's going to be successful, and I'll never have to do this again. And then you have people who are just, this is literally the best they can get. Either they accept it, like I Mm -hmm. think Lonnie does, 
And you have people who resent the fact that this is the best they can get. Their life is in a rut. They don't have any prospects. They don't have any other avenue. And it builds this resentment and it builds this frustration. And I think that's the big thing with Abdullah here is he's very angry and he has nowhere to put that anger. And he just feels like he doesn't know where to go. What I like, though, he is kind of the asshole who's always snapping at people, but he's not always wrong. Mm -hmm. We'll get to the Richard Pryor character, but when the Richard Pryor character comes, all the criticisms that Abdullah throws at him about how he's basically just swindling people out of money is basically like a pimp are true. You know, you have the character that we'll get to of the manager's son, who's also drawn to, we're going to have a revolution and we're going to free the people and the working class are going to rise up. And Abdullah just kind of throws back at him. Who exactly do you think they're going to rise up and revolt against? Mm -hmm. You privileged white kid are among the people. <laughs> you're not mm -hmm. part of the revolution. You're part of the people that we're going to revolt against. I like that it's not always presenting him as like a fool. It's just he has anger, he has thoughts and opinions, and he just doesn't know where his life is going, and he just makes some wrong choices. Some of the other deleted scenes that were more poignant were there was going to be more of a clash between him and Earl, the guy who's the kind of prim and proper right-hand man waxer. of the manager. Yeah. Then there was, there's a scene in the movie where he's just sitting alone in the locker room playing a saxophone. The old man who shines shoes walks in. Then that was actually going to carry on to a conversation where he's just like, why do you spend all these years shining the shoes of the men who look down on you? And it's like, it's what I do. I enjoy it. It's peaceful. And what's wrong with it? Mm. It's frustration of being in the low class, you know, of being a working laboring man. I get that. And it's interesting seeing people who are just, you know, it's a life, it's a living, it's work, I do it, I get paid, I work with my family, and then you have people who resent it. But it also doesn't vilify him for it. Mm -mm. That's what I like about it. I guess, like, to me, it was one of the things that was kind of throwing me off a lot was, like, every time, he, you know, he said, my name's Abdullah now, and, like, everyone would make fun of him. And sometimes mm -hmm. it almost felt like we were supposed to be laughing with them at him. You know what I mean? Like, it was just kind of a little weird to me that otherwise he was a sympathetic character. I think it says a lot that there are some people who adjust to it and some people who are like, oh, I'm sorry, Abdullah. You know, they either mm -hmm. change it or they call him Abdullah right from the start or there are people who mock it. I think they use that to very much establish how all these characters relate to each other in terms of who's accepting of his new identity and who is mocking him for it. Right, because I think it's Earl and Mr. B, I think they are the ones who really continue to refer him as Dwayne as opposed to Abdullah. I think most everyone else, they don't continue to make that mistake over and over again. Lonnie is very quick to adjust to it. And it's like every scene mm -hmm. from then on, he's always calling him Abdullah. You have the boss who I don't think gets it, who like keeps going, right, Dwayne, sure. oh, I'm sorry, Abdullah. Well, but there's the whole scene where they're making fun of him because he doesn't eat meat now yeah. and stuff like that. Well, and I wonder like how prevalent people converting to Muslim in Islam was in the 70s. That was actually a big part of the Black Power movement. And, you know, yeah. Muhammad right. Ali and how that right. was a big when he changed his name in the 60s and early 70s. Yeah, you know, there was a lot of stuff like that that was going on in yeah. the black community. So then we get Darrow Ingus and Otis Day as Floyd and Lloyd. They're fun. <laughs> <laughs> they're the two, I don't know if they're brothers or friends, but they're the guys who are, again, using this as a stepping stone. They want to go out and do their big music and dance performance group, you know, Basically, they're sparkle bros, you know, <laughs> they want to go out and become rich and famous performers and they're just working at a car wash for the moment. Yep. I like the fact that they continuously are practicing their steps. Mm -hmm. There's not a whole lot to their story. That's right. pretty much it. They just practice dancing. I was dancing with them. I was like, oh, yeah, y'all guys are good. You're going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> What I like is how they mix that whole, the person at the labor job who wants to go out and become famous, while also giving a reason for why people are dancing as we have our musical montage sequence. Because <laughs> it's almost always them. Because they're the first right. people as your car comes in, and they're doing their dance moves as they're cleaning cars. They make that a great way to kind of anchor a lot of the big montage sequences. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Dwayne Jesse is the one. Otis Day is actually a fictional character that he plays, but he's actually since gone on to perform as that character. Oh, okay. Because at IMDb, it calls him Otis Day. That's what I thought, but I'm looking at him. Otis Day is a character that he played in Animal House huh. and has since gone on to create a stage act as that character. Oh, okay. Interesting. Then we get to the constantly feuding buddies of Pepe Serna as Chuko and Henry Kingi as Goody. Goody is, you know, the long haired Native American guy who always wears the cartoon mouse ears. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Chuko is the goofball who, there's that scene where he borrows the ears, goes up against the glass, makes the face, and ends up making it look like Goody's messing with the secretary. So she goes and just dumps a bucket of water on Goody, and he's stuffing hot peppers in the other guy's taco. And 
and they're just constantly feuding each other back and forth as the movie. They're the goofballs. Yeah, I didn't really like them at all. <laughs> I guess the whole like looking at a girl in the bathroom, that's not really a joke that has aged well no. at this point. They're just so ridiculous that it's not even funny to me. It's just like a lot of really typical screwball comedy jokes. And I'm just like, eh, I could totally do without these two guys. <laughs> I'd be fine. They're both hamming it up a lot. And in a film like this, which is already a little hammy to begin with, I don't know if we really needed it that much more. I mean, I didn't hate them, but they don't really add anything other than maybe just a few extra jokes that really are kind of meh. Yeah, they're definitely more just the straight up comedy of the Mm -hmm. constantly dueling bros. Even like the whole thing where they're washing cars and then throwing water balloons at each other at the cars, you know, and it's like, how are they not the ones getting fired? (laughs) Right. yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to remember, were they the one? I can't remember who were the ones who were throwing butter up on the ceiling in the diner. Was it them or was that someone else? No, that was someone else. That might have been Floyd and Lloyd. It's hard to remember who did what. I can't even remember, right? Because it was such like a weird little minor scene. Which gets a payoff later in the movie. Uh Uh-huh. First, I'm like, what is he throwing? (laughs) Like, I couldn't even figure it out for a while there. Little pats of butter, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there is Garrett Morris's slide. Garrett Morris, of course, one of the original founding members of Saturday Night Live. Mm. He's the con man bookie who's always trying to basically milk everyone for as much money as they can around the lot. And he's the one who actually gets busted by cops at one point. Mm Mm-hmm. I like Garrett Morris, but he didn't have anything to do here. They play up like he's trying to get money and stuff, and then mm. he doesn't really do anything after that for like most of the film until he gets arrested and gets out of the film for the rest of the movie. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's not a payoff. You could make that into a payoff. Like, that's why he's trying to get the money is he's trying to pay off these parking tickets, but that's not a payoff. That's just the thing mm. that happens. And I get that this is a day in life type thing, but it's hard to talk about him as a character when he doesn't really have any characteristics. Right, right. If he wasn't Garrett Morris, you wouldn't remember him at all, most likely. That scene of him getting arrested, I think, is a good reflection for Lonnie's character because you see that momentary fear for him when the cops show up and things like that. But the character itself is just kind of there. (laughs) He doesn't have any real purpose. That's again why I regret that they had cut from the script stuff that they did. Mm. He had a key to the local vending machine, so he would like steal out a bunch of sodas and sell them for half price. He was a drug dealer. And actually, the reason why they busted him for that vehicle that he had was because they found drugs in it Mm -hmm. Mm. and you see throughout the film like several characters going off and smoking a joint now and then he was the drug dealer who was always selling them stuff Mm. there was a lot more about him being a bookie and a con man and a drug dealer in the script a lot of that got cut out so i don't quite know why they still had the scene of him getting arrested because it doesn't really have any payoff or impact to anything that he does Mm -hmm. one scene that i really liked by him it was just a funny comedy scene was there was that whole bit where the guy in the full body cast was going through the car wash (laughs) yeah (laughs) and you just have garrett morris going how you doing man how you doing (laughs) how do you end up like this (laughs) well man that's really hard man (laughs) (laughs) that was just such a ridiculous sequence and i enjoyed it And then Antonio Fargus as Lindy, the openly gay, very (laughs) exuberant person who's trying to open up a hair salon. Again, a very, very openly and obviously gay character in a 70s black car wash movie. Possibly even trans, though that's not made explicit. Well, this was at a time when a lot of the definitions hadn't really come in and... Blurred together. Right, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of gender non-binary or fluidity to the character, and Mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to define because those terms weren't quite there yet. Right, right. right. Angie, what do you think of Lindy? He's a lot of fun. I mean, there's certainly some, I guess, stereotypes at play, But I never really felt like he was meant to be laughed at for being gay. I think the fact that Joel wrote this certainly helps loan to that. I think Antonio Fargus does a lot of fun with it, really makes the character likable and enjoyable for most of the film. So yeah, I liked him a lot. He didn't have a whole lot to do, but whenever he was there, you couldn't help but notice him. Yeah, I'm going to refer to her as a she just for simplicity's sake, but Mm -hmm. I thought that she was portrayed as extremely positively for this era. I like the fact that for the most part, yeah, the guys give her some shit, but they don't really like... She's part of the family. Yeah. I think Abdullah is the only one who really gets into her face about it. And she has the best comeback in the film. Yeah. Honey, I'm more man than you'll ever be and more woman than you'll ever get. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's one of the best lines in the film. 
And she's treated with respect. And yeah, there is some jokes that are probably paid at her expense. But she usually gets a comeback to them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like she has a dignity to her and it never keeps her yeah. down. Uh-uh. I think they are very much a great Joel character. To have a film like this, to have not only an openly gay character, but an openly gay character that other people respect, that Mm -hmm. every time they get mocked, they usually have a comeback to throw right back in the face of the person who's mocking them. They're usually always given the last laugh. While very flamboyant, very over the top, it's not in an unrealistic way. Right. Because again, Joel himself is a very flamboyant individual. And to just fully acknowledge it, I'm gay. Even the film has odd side trips about people complaining about homosexuals. Like you even have the boss talking to his son about, God, this one guy Mm. died eating a hamburger because his son told him he was a homosexual. You're not a homosexual, are you? Not yet. Not yet. yet. (laughs) And again, it's more just challenging the prejudices against homosexuality than it is relating to them. Well, it's really telling, like the very first scene that we see, Lindy, is you hear on the radio them talking about how the senators are exchanging sexual favors with male secretaries or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you have like somebody say, like, I don't have a problem with homosexuals as long as they stay in their place. And then you see Lindy walk into the women's bathroom. And I thought Mm -hmm. that was a nice, subtle, but reinforces, I think, Joel's politics on the matter. And that's one that I think we're all in favor of. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I thought it was really a well done character. And I thought she really shined. And I like the character whenever there's a lot of the jokey banter going on, Lindy is usually a part of that instead of at the expense of it. Right. Right. And even when TC is trying to spruce up for the date, Lindy's instantly there helping him spruce up the fro and Mm -hmm. they're part of the team. There's someone that everyone is used to. And again, for a film made in 1976, that was a rare thing to see. Yeah. Yeah. That again, that Joel did that and that Michael Schultz stuck to it and Mm -hmm. embraced that side of the script. Because again, not a word of this is different from how it was in Joel's script. I think was really kind of an amazing thing that they got away with that at the time. Yeah. The, the studio didn't try to interfere or anything either, right? Mm-hmm. Well, and I imagine that, like a lot of people just saw it and like, oh, it's a guy dressed up as a woman. That's hilarious. And that's all I really thought too much about it. But the fact that it was done so respectfully, you know, was completely missed on the radar. It actually has nuance instead of being a stereotype. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Just trying to remember some of the other kind of smaller characters. There's Scruggs, who's the cowboy. Oh, yeah. Like the one white guy there who's like such a cowboy. Mm -hmm. And he's dealing with a fight with, I don't know if it's wife or his girlfriend. And now she's finally going to drive and pick him up at the end of the day. And she ends up just throwing his bags full of clothes out on the street and driving away. (laughs) I feel like they had to come and bring it up again every now and then to remind yeah. us that it was his story beat. It's easy to forget. Right. But it was such a small payoff. I'm like, I don't know if that was really necessary. You could have just had her show up in the middle of the day and do that. And then he'd be bummed out. He didn't know where he was going to sleep or something. You know, like you could have done other things with it. Eh, it was fine. It was mm-hmm. there. <laughs> I really didn't have a whole lot of opinion. I mean, he's just <laughs> there. I mean, he gets a couple of like decent moments because he's got the cowboy hat. He kind of stands out a little bit more, I think. Yeah, he doesn't wear the orange outfit. He just has the whole denim suit. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the 70s and he's a cowboy. He almost doesn't feel like he works there, but he is. <laughs> right. Yeah, he, right. Just, he was fine. I, I like the scene, like they're washing the car with the dog in it. Lindy and Hippo are kind of afraid to vacuum in there. And so he walks up and he just like grabs Lindy by the leg and barks and she jumps. And it's just a couple of moments that kind of amused me like that. But he's just another the gang. Yeah. There was another scene from the script that was cut a bit with these two businessmen from out of town who pull up and they talk to Scruggs and they give him this heartfelt story of I'm searching for my son. We're just trying to find him. He ran away. He's gay. Do you know if there's like any gay clubs in the area that we can start looking for him? And Scruggs is like, yeah, yeah, let me help you out. And I know just who to ask. Goes over and asks Lindy (laughs) and then comes right back and gives them like a whole list of clubs in the area. And then the two guys are like, oh man, we're getting laid tonight. And they drive off. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, again, he's just another character there. And like the remaining characters, like we have uh, Justin played by Leanne Pinkney. He's the guy who had a fight with his girlfriend and she keeps showing up and they keep fighting. But then they reconcile at the end. There's not much more to his character, but he does have that one little nice moment with Erwin. Where he, Erwin, we'll go ahead and bring up Erwin. Erwin is the boss's son. He's kind of the privileged middle class white kid who wants to be a part of, you know, he has good intentions. Mm-hmm. He always has the book of, was it Mao? Mao, yeah. Mm-hmm. The guy who did the communist revolt in China. He's about, you know, 
I believe in the working class. I want to be a part of the workers. The workers are going to rise up one day. And it's like, you're just not part of this group. <laughs> right. He's kind of like the opposite of Abdullah, where the two of them are drawn to these revolutionary ideas, where Abdullah, it's more about anger and take down all the people who are making me feel bad. Mm -hmm. And Erwin is kind of more, I just want to be a part of something. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you do have the bits where he is trying to go and work among the people at the car wash, and they're just basically getting him all covered in soapy water and just messing with him every chance they get. I'm the first human to go through the car wash. Yay. <laughs> Far out, man. <laughs> No one takes him seriously. No one no. respects him. No one takes him seriously. And he's just kind of like, well, hopefully I'll come and work with you guys again. And Justin does have that nice moment where everyone else just dismisses Erwin. He's just like, yeah, Erwin, I hope you come back again someday. Mm -hmm. At least giving him some connection to the people who work here, even though he has <laughs> he's trying, but he's not. He's just kind of a clueless dope. Yeah. And then we had Charlie, played by Arthur French, who, again, was just kind of part of the background. Mm -hmm. He just had a few bits here and there. I can't remember him at all, honestly. I think he was there talking with Lonnie when his parole officer came up. Yeah. And was it him or was it Lloyd who had the fly shit scene? You know, there's nothing lower than fly shit. I think that was Lloyd. That's what I thought, yeah. And then we have Earl, the waxer. <laughs> Perfect position for him. He's the very spit and polish bootlicker, you know, always mm -hmm. trying to be the boss and trying to be in the boss's shadow just to try to get respect. Nobody respects him. Yeah. Yeah, he should have applied to be a butler somewhere. <laughs> I think he would have been very well suited <laughs> for that kind of job. He works well as the occasional butt of jokes, the whole thing with the dog poop. It's a pretty yeah. small part. I liked him. It's kind of a standard comedy role. He's the uptight guy, the stuffed shirt, who thinks he's better than everyone because he's the only guy who doesn't have to get wet in his job. But he's still working with everybody else. He just puts on airs. It's a very common trope, but it works here. Yeah. I think that dog shit scene sums up his character perfectly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's the one who's, when the dog goes and takes crap on the ground, ordering other people to clean it up, he even brings them a box, put it in this box, get it out of here, clean it up, do your job. And as he's leaving for the day, finds that they planted that box of dog shit upside down right on the back hood of his car. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's not wrong, but he takes everything so seriously that he's impossible to respect. Yeah. And then we get Mr. B, played by Sully Bayar. He's this kind of subby middle-aged guy. He runs a business. It's not a very successful business. The car wash is actually losing business because they have a fully automated one that just moved in down the block. And he's trying to keep everything running and keeping everyone working. And, and cheating on his wife. And cheating on his <laughs> wife with the secretary. Yeah. He's okay. He's got a few moments that really made me laugh. When he's talking with Lonnie, like Lonnie's all upset because Lonnie has ideas for the car wash to keep it working better and possibly bring in more business. And he kind of wants to write him off. And again, I think that goes to the class and racial elements that the film touches upon. But he then kind of realizes, like, maybe I should listen to him. And when he shakes hand with Lonnie at the end of the film, it actually feels like a genuinely warm moment. But otherwise, he's just the boss. He's the guy, like, everybody mostly likes him except for Abdullah, but they don't really, like, respect him much. Yeah, obviously, since I've brought it up, I kind of wish they would have dropped that little plot of him trying to get with the secretary, because without it, he's kind of just a guy who may not respect his workers as much as he should, but he's clearly trying to give them work, give them a chance to make some money, trying to keep his business afloat, doing the best he can with it. He's kind of a schmuck, but I think there's a good heart in there as well. I just, like I said, I could have done without him hitting on her in all those scenes. It's going to be interesting when we get to the Joel Schumacher romances, because these are the ones he does not write <laughs> romance for you. Know. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I think that's the stereotype of, you know, the boss sleeping with the secretary. Mm -hmm. And again, he's not played as a bad guy. He's not a ball breaker. I think he just doesn't identify with the workers and the workers don't identify with him. Right. I've seen that before where, you know, the bosses come from a whole different background than the people who are actually working on the ground. And it's not that they're at odds all the time. It's just they don't relate to each other very well. Mm -hmm. I think a large part of it is he's also just kind of frustrated. His business isn't doing very well. It just took a big hit because there's the new automated car wash. He's trying to sell this car wash as, well, we're not automated. We've got the personal touch. But he's still mm -hmm. losing money because of it. Yeah. The car wash is on the ropes at the moment. The entire business is on the ropes, but he can't tell anyone that because then he won't. <laughs> and I like that he has that honesty with Lonnie, where Lonnie is like, I'm trying to tell you, I'm on the ground. I'm working here. I see how everything runs. There's ways we can make it more efficient. There's ways we can better use the space. There's ways we can better manage it. And the boss is just, I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. 
And I like that it ends with him promising Lonnie, I'm going to make time for this. Lonnie is someone that he trusts, that he's brought into the business even beyond just being a worker. I mean, Lonnie's the guy, again, this ex-con working for you that you trust with going through all the money at the end of the day, getting it tallied Mm -hmm. up, putting it in the safe. He does his job well, that he's going to actually sit down and listen to him and say, okay, what are your ideas? What do you got? I like that it ends on that note. And yeah, then there's the whole sleeping with secretary thing. Yeah. <laughs> Which I wouldn't have minded if it would gone somewhere, but right. it just seems like he's hitting on her. He's like, I'm going to try to get away tonight. Are you free? And she's blowing him off a little bit. When it's, are you free again? They have been sleeping together. Right. 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 And then that's Melanie Mayron as Marsha. Again, the bubbly secretary. Everyone's kind of gawking at. But I kind of like that she wasn't just a pure on bombshell. They got a really good comedian to play the role. Mm-hmm. She's really funny. She has lots of these funny bits, like where she drops the contact lens and the cold cream. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a great character thing, but she's sleeping with the boss because it helps further her prospects. Mm-hmm. She has no interest in them. There's no actual relationship with them. Right. It didn't need to be there. I wish it almost wasn't. But I kind of like then that there's the whole thing where she gets hit on by the flashy business guy who mm-hmm. Tim Thomerson oh I love Tim Thomerson that's the star of Trancers <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm not familiar with him at all he was the full moon video version of Bruce Campbell <laughs> okay and it was so funny seeing him one of his early roles here but yeah, then she gets hit on by the business guy and she has no time for Mr. B. Right. They're kind of doing the typical thing of she wants to get her face done so she can go out and be a star. And mm. you're just someone who just keeps dreaming of bigger things, even though she has no likelihood of ever getting there. Yeah. She's got a lot of charm. She's a likable character. She is fun. I'm glad to see that Melanie Mayron went on to do a lot of stuff and is actually working as a director now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I saw that she directed an episode of Glow just mm-hmm. recently. Mm. Yeah, and she's been directing a lot. Well, she was one of the main cast of 30-something. Mm. Oh, okay. And actually started directing on there and has since done like Dawson's Creek, Ed, State of Grace, Nash Bridges. And again, like Michael Schultz, she's just become a really steady TV director. Then the payoff, though, was the whole hitting on the businessman was there was going to be a scene at the end of the movie where the businessman pulls up in his car with another woman at his side and she finds out that she's actually the intended date for the schlubby best friend in the backseat. Oh, mm. yeah. I'm glad they didn't do that then. That's sad. Yeah, I know. <laughs> And then we should probably get to the prostitute, Lauren Jones, at least at the time. I don't know if she still is, but she was the wife at the time of Michael Schultz. She just kind of drifts through the film. You know, she mm-hmm. skips out on cab fare. She hides out in the ladies room for a while. She hides out in the men's room for a while. And is just changing, cleaning up, just kind of drifting around, getting a beer, has no real direction in mind, sleeps with hippo. <laughs> She's not so much a Greek chorus as she's just the Greek disinterested observer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they gave her a little bit of a story where she's in love with the guy named Joe and then she goes to call and it, like, he gave her the wrong number. Yeah, but I think she fell in love with a John. Mm-hmm. And you even see that at the bit where she sees Hippo leaving and she almost has this kind of longing look and he just drives off and doesn't even look at her. and She looks a little crushed yeah. by it. Yeah, She's kind of that prostitute who just is a little bit of a hopeless romantic. Yeah, I don't really have much else to say about it. I don't know it's like she's there but for as much as she's there and as much as she's doing she's not really contributing much of anything to the plot it seems like it's just something else to cut to yeah i kind of like the idea that like she had maybe not had feelings for hippo but at least thought wouldn't it have been nice if he had actually taken a moment to like say goodbye which is why she whispers it when he drives away but it could have been fleshed out a lot better and as it is like you said she's the observer of the show this whole movie but she doesn't actually have a part to play in it for the most part and that's where i kind of like it because again she's the dreamer stuck in a rut when like hippo goes to get her attention she just instantly flashes twenty dollars you know and she's been doing this for a while it's not a job she enjoys but it's a job she knows how to do she keeps hoping that something will come along I think that's where it overlaps with a lot of the people at the car wash, but she's not a part of the people. She spends the entire day with these people and is never a part of them. Mm -hmm. I don't even think they notice that she's there most of the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, Hippo's the only person she interacts with, the only person that she forms any kind of a connection with. And at the end of the day, even he just drives off and doesn't notice her. Again, she very much comes from the original image that Joel had of something that he saw in real life that he really clicked with that kind of inspired him for this story. Mm -hmm. And I actually just like how she's part of it. And again, she's not really a comedic character. She's not really a tragic character. It's just this is just another person living their life who passes through this car wash this day. I liked it. I thought it was an interesting character. Mm -hmm. And I should point out, she is still the wife of Michael Schultz and is actually a Tony-nominated Broadway actress. Oh, wow, okay. She does a lot of stage work. The only other characters then are some of the patrons. Like, we have 
Uh, what was the name of the mom with the throwing up kid? Lorraine Gary is the actress. Yes. They just call her hysterical lady. Hysterical lady. Like. Yeah, we have Lorraine Gary, the wife from Jaws. <laughs> is that where I recognize yeah. her from? She like, looks familiar. I know yeah. I've seen this lady before. She's yeah. the one who came back for Jaws the Revenge. This time it's personal. <laughs> it's Lorraine Gary uh, as the woman with the kid who's constantly throwing up outside the car. She rushes into the car wash to get it all cleaned up refuses to tip because she isn't satisfied with how it's clean and as she drives off the kid pukes all over her in the inside of the car mm. <laughs> i was shocked to see a car phone in 1976 i didn't realize yeah. they had them that was when they were introduced okay yeah they still had the cord and then they were wired into the car antenna okay yeah it's very much a status symbol and she talks about like this is what she gets for going to places outside of beverly hills or something like that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She's very much the elitist, rich wife type character. I remember when they did that whole curtain call closing credit scene where they just kind of went over all the stars as the radio announcer was going over them. I know Mm -hmm. he didn't call her hysterical lady. He called her Mrs. Beverly Hills. No, yeah. (laughs) That's why I couldn't find her credit. I was looking for that. But I mean, what's interesting is she's kind of almost relatable at first, where it's like, God, her son is sick and just puking all over everything. And she just wants to get it cleaned up. And then she just does that one jerk move and then becomes a punchline to it. <laughs> well, but even on the phone, she's like talking about how big and important she is okay. and everything. So from the moment, I'm like, OK, I mean, it's amusing yeah. because this person that's so snobby and she's got to deal with this rather gross <laughs> situation. The first thing she said it. Vomit outside the window, but aim away from the car. Yeah. You know, right, like, right. I mean, obviously, I would say that, but it's just the way she said it. It just sounded like mm-hmm. she was more concerned about the car than the kid. Absolutely. I think Scruggs cared more about the kid when he grabbed that bucket yeah. for him when they couldn't right. get inside the bathroom than she really cared about the fact that her son was sick. And then the fact that she was knocking on the women's restroom and when it was occupied, like she doesn't even try like the men's. Just go to the men's room. Just go in the men's room. Mm-hmm. And God, yeah, just the nice touch of that whole gross stain on the kid's shirt afterwards. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We kind of already mentioned the couple where the guy was in the full body cast. Yeah. Then we have the Mad Bomber, played by (laughs) stand-up comedian (laughs) Professor Erwin Corey, who was always a very fun presence in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. I admit, it was one of the funnier sequences. Like, I yeah. laughed a lot during him, like, chasing after TC with his bottle of urine. Thief! <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't been able to piss for two days! <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty fun presence. I, you know, he doesn't do a whole lot because he's just there to look a little eccentric and then the whole gag goes off. Admittedly, if it's a known thing that there's a bomber going around L.A. using <laughs> Coke bottles and tinfoil, maybe don't use a Coke bottle. He strikes me as someone who doesn't pay attention to the news very much. Yeah. No, no. You'd think his doctor would have maybe given him some kind of receptacle if he was going to give a sample. I don't know. (laughs) Maybe left it at home. Yeah, because I hope you rinsed out the bottle, because otherwise it's going to show, oh, you have orange soda syndrome. (laughs) (laughs) Your urine is surprisingly high in high fructose corn syrup. (laughs) Have you tried going diet? A lot of these bits are just screwball comedy, you know, the mad bomber, Mm -hmm. the Mm -hmm. guy in the full body cast, the vomiting kid, the dog shit. Mm -hmm. It's like, again, compared to disorderlies, where the problem with disorderlies is not only was it a shitty script, but you're asking these people who are not talented performers to do these gags. I think what helps here is you have a really great cast who knows how to pull off these gags. Mm -hmm. As stupid as they are, they're well-written gags, and Michael Schultz is directing them well. Right. I think it shows what Michael Schultz can do when you actually give him good material and good performers. Mm -hmm. And then there's disorderlies. Not to constantly compare the two, but they're comparable. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And then let's go ahead and get to George Carlin, where in the script, you have the bit where the hooker hops out on the cab fare, and he just kind of runs around looking for her for a scene and then gets another fare and drives away. Mm. And here, it's like George Carlin was around. They wanted to keep him around more, so he spends the entire film looking for, have you seen a tall, blonde, black lady? Right. And then even his whole monologue in the cab about how, you know, people just aren't nice and trusting anymore. Can you move it, you son of a bitch? That was all George Carlin. <laughs> That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a very George Carlin bit. Yeah, you can tell it was very much an excuse to use him a lot because he really didn't have anything to say. I mean, it's a nice payoff mm-hmm. when he actually goes up to her and <laughs> asks her if she's seen the tall black lady with the blonde wig. Because she changed wigs. He doesn't recognize her. Yeah. Right. But ultimately, he probably didn't have to be there for as long as he was. Most of the scenes in between don't really go anywhere. They were all quick. There's nothing wrong with them. Like I said, it was like, that's the payoff. Like after you 
have him there for so long, that's your payoff. Like, I kind of feel like if it had just been two quick scenes, it would have had a little bit stronger of a payoff for me. That's all. I will agree that if you're going to have George Carlin there improvising bits, you would have at least more dialogue than just, hey, have you seen a tall blonde black woman? Right, Mm -hmm. right. Have Carlin just constantly still going on rants and people just kind of being like, what? Mm -hmm. But even then, that might have gone on too long, too, if they had done that. Yeah. I love George Carlin as a stand-up. I felt like he felt a little too shticky here. George Carlin's never been a great actor, I'll say that. Well, I've seen him do, like, okay, like some of the Kevin Smith films he's appeared in. I mean, he's not great. He's hammy. Mm -hmm. But it seems like he was like, I'm going to play a character. And so he's like... The accent. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, the accent. It was like him overemphasizing it just a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. Other than that, like I kind of agree with Angie. It's like, it's a cute gag, but the payoff isn't strong enough considering that it's George Carlin. You're like, you're expecting something really Mm -hmm. funny. And it's like, oh, you didn't recognize the lady because she changed her wig. That's funny, I guess. Oh, okay. I think that's funny. I think maybe you didn't need to have like five people that he stopped and talked to. Maybe bring that down to two or three. Right. But I still don't mind. It's such a small part of the movie. It does not overstay its welcome for me. I know like the idea was to have her around for the whole day. But even if like she had gone back into the cab and he had been so clueless that he had once again taken her in. Oh, at the end of the day when she leaves, she hails a cab. Right. <laughs> like that would have been a good way to pay it off. Like he's about to not get paid again and he doesn't even know it. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been great. That would have been funny, yeah. And then Richard Pryor. (laughs) As Daddy Rich, the flashy local televangelist who just comes rolling up one day with his limo and his, was it the Pointer Sisters? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And wants to get his shoe shine and all that. So basically just flashing around to get people to give him donations, even though he hates Mm -hmm. everyone. I assume he was already a big star at this point, right? Oh, yes. So, like, it does kind of feel like, hey, we need a big name in this film. So let's sort of grind everything to a halt (laughs) for a while to let Richard Pryor do his thing. I was a little disappointed with it. I felt like they could have been a little bit more biting in their commentary of those kind of televangelists. He's good in it. The Pointer Sisters doing their little song is fun. I I don't know. Like I said, I wanted a little bit more. I guess I had higher expectations because it was Richard Pryor. I liked it because I think he pays off a little bit better on my expectations. You know, when I saw George Carlin, I was like, oh, this is going to be great. And then Mm. it didn't pay off as much. Richard Pryor, I kept expecting him to play a bigger role, and then he just wasn't there until halfway through the movie, and then all of a sudden, he has this big scene, and then he's gone. Mm-hmm. But I think it paid off relatively better. He gets a few good moments. I like the Pointer Sisters song as well. And there's one of my favorite subtle gags is the shoe shine guy. Oh, yeah. He gives the guy a dollar, and then the driver takes out a hat, and they start giving donations, and the shine guy gives the dollar back. Right back, yep. Yeah. So basically, he didn't pay for his shoe shine. So it was like a nice little gag that you could Mm -hmm. easily miss. I liked it. I think my only thing is the Pointer Sisters musical number, which was not a part of the script. That was something that was added. I don't know where that came from. (laughs) I think that did cause the scene to go on longer than it needed to and kind of distracted from the ultimate point of the scene. Yeah, that's fair. Where the actual debate between Abdullah and Daddy Rich was supposed to be the point of the scene where it's like everyone just buys Mm -hmm. into this guy because they're so drawn to the promise that he offers of one day I'm going to strike it rich and I'm going to be flashy and I'm going to be driving around a limo and he's just another thief. He's just another pimp. Mm-hmm. Right. Abdullah throwing that back in his face. And again, everyone just not taking Abdullah seriously, even though he's right. You know, I think mm-hmm. that was a really good scene that I do think went on too long and became too much of a bit. Yeah, I can see that. I think maybe that's kind of what I was saying earlier about how I was sort of confused about how they were treating Abdullah is like the sisters are all getting in his face and maybe it's because it goes on for so long. Mm-hmm. Whereas if his points, like, even if everybody doesn't agree with him, might have stood out a little stronger if that song hadn't come back in his face like that. In the scripts, as Abdul is raising these points, Daddy Rich finds a way to twist as a way to just kind of hastily get out of the situation and start leaving. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, by drawing it out, then you get the whole, the guy passing the cap around and getting money and the musical number, and that all wasn't in the script. So it's like, I think they did change the direction of the scene. Yeah. And I gotta say, I was surprised. I always knew Richard Pryor was in this movie, and Mm -hmm. I read the script before I looked at the cast or watched trailer or anything, and I'm like, oh, I'm guessing Richard Pryor, he's got to be either the con man or he's got to be Lonnie he's probably one of the main characters in the movie and then I finished reading the script and I watched the trailer for the movie I'm like nope really he's just in the one cameo scene okay 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, if you look at the poster, yeah. he's last build, but his name is like got a border around it where they're trying to draw attention to mm-hmm. this is Richard Pryor's in this film. Well, and the version of the film I bought was a four film Richard Pryor box set. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. So. It reminds me of, um, oh, God, what was the name of that movie that Mark Hamill was in? The Giver. The Giver. The Giver. It was the first one. Where they put him on the poster. Right. Yeah, like they put Mark Hamill on the poster and everything, and it's like he's barely in that movie. Like uh-huh. it was very much like, please buy this film because this star you know is in it. Yeah. And I got to say, I'm looking him up. He had actually not starred in a movie as the star of a movie by this point. He had been in quite a few movies going back to the late 60s. He had bits where he was like the sidekick of the hero or he was in ensembles like The Mm -hmm. Mac and Uptown Saturday Night and the Bingo Long Traveling All-Star and Motor Kings where he's part of a group of people, but he had not starred in a movie by this point. I would imagine his stand-up was probably getting some notice, though. Oh, he was a hugely prominent stand-up going back to the early 60s. So people at least knew him, even if he wasn't in films as much yet. Mm -hmm. The same year he did this is when he did Silver Streak, the first of the films with him and Gene Wilder. Okay. Mm -hmm. This was like right as he's breaking out into a star, into his own leading man, which again only lasted for a few years because then there was the whole cocaine freebasing incident and then Superman 3. (laughs) But he did quite a few films. And again, Michael Schultz's next film, Which Way Is Up, is a film starring Richard Pryor. And then he did Blue Collar, which was his first major dramatic role. And this was like right at that point where Richard Pryor was going from being this almost cult figure to breaking out into the mainstream. And again, I thought he had a much bigger part in this than he ultimately did. I'm going to be disappointed if we get to DC Cab and Mr. T is only in it for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm trying to remember if there's anyone. Well, I mean, there's who's the little kid? Calvin. Calvin. Michael Fennell. The snotty little kid on a skateboard. Yeah, he was a jerk. Yeah. Especially that last scene with him. <laughs> it was nice to see his mom thoroughly going to punish him for it. But yeah, he was a jerk. And that's one of those things that I don't think fully translated from the script to screen where everyone hates him. But then there's that moment mm-hmm. where they all think he's been hit by a car. Right. And everyone is just like, no, Calvin, are you okay? And he's fine and just yells at them again. And then his mom swats him and drinks <laughs> He was just another presence. I think he's just there to make it, oh, like, this place is so fun because even, like, the kids just play around and, yeah, they give him a hard time, but they do actually care because, you know, as you see, like, when he almost gets hit and they all, like, freak out. I thought that was a nice little moment, but it's one thing that probably could have gotten cut also and not he wouldn't have missed it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that he's there. He's just another fun presence that pops in and out of the movie. Him being dragged off by his mom would have been a great way to just end it, but... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't think they attached you enough to the character to have the full emotional payoff of the, oh my god, now he's dead. Mm -hmm. Oh, but wait, he's not. They even introduce him falling off of his skateboard. Scruggs goes over to help him, and the kid just, you know, blows a raspberry in his face and rides off. Yeah. He's a little asshole. Mm Mm-hmm. Again, he's just another presence in the movie. I think he even had more bits in the script where it's like a scene is playing out. Calvin wanders by in the background, has a punchline and goes away, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So he was more of a constant. Not really any better of a presence, but again, he was still fine. I do love the one shot of just following him as he's skateboarding along past everyone else. And he goes past the sign, thank you, come again, that they use even again at the end of the credits. Yeah, he was a good use for aiding in like montage and moving from time period to time period. Mm Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is, Angie, we got into this in Sparkle where there were like a lot of scenes that were fully scripted that they then kind of recut as a montage. Mm, Yeah. Joel actually wrote quite a few of these sequences as a montage. Okay. What's interesting, though, is he scripts always say and the radio DJ does this, this and this, but he doesn't actually fully detail what the radio DJ says. He kind of left that open for whoever it is that they got as the radio DJ. Mm hmm. I think one of them at least was a real live DJ. Yeah. And he very much detailed these montages in the script. So it's like we're not re-editing scenes or or taking things out of context. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's three different DJs because it's following an entire day. You have the morning DJ, your noon DJ, and your afternoon DJ. Okay, So that's actually neat that they actually went with that detail. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. Right. And I like that the song gets played three times. Yeah, I was going to say that. Because, yeah, if you were listening to the same radio station the whole day, that probably would happen if that was like the big hit for the time yeah and to be fair car wash is a damn good song it is <laughs> oh yeah i'm kind of looking forward to it not being stuck in my head <laughs> i've been thinking about it so much doing this and i'm like it's there but it was stuck in my head just prepping for this movie before i even watched the movie i'm sure right yeah and again it was by norman whitfield who, who was one of the major major disco era music producers mm-hmm. and it was created for this film right yes yes 
the soundtrack for this film won a Grammy. Mm -hmm. Best score soundtrack album. It won the Grammy in 1977. So yeah, it was created for this. Yeah, and I think, at least on Wikipedia, they said that they actually did the soundtrack before the movie so that they could actually listen to the songs while they were filming. He Mm. wanted that authentic feel to it. That might also explain some of the ADR, too. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I like that detail. Again, it's like they filmed Mm -hmm. this in chronological order, so it's like your actors are just going through this day, probably over the course of a few weeks, but still, it's neat how you get to just let the actors... If you find a great cast and you just let them settle into a place and settle into their characters and everything, Mm -hmm. that's what I really like is you get all these moments where it's like everyone is together and just playing off each other and you not only have all these characters, but you have these little moments of relationships between the characters where it's like, how do Hippo and Lindy always relate to each other when they're both cleaning the front seats? How do Floyd and Lloyd relate to each other? You know, it's like as you're going through all the stages, it's just kind of seeing how each character, all the characters bounce off each other. Mm-hmm. And again, like I don't think Hippo and TC really had any scenes before the Mad Bomber scene, but then it's like, boom, here's a scene where they're together for the entire of it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what I like about ensemble films like this. Establish these good characters, get good actors playing them, and then just seeing how they play off each other. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's any other characters to mention. I don't think so. I mean, I should point out the TV cut of this. I don't know if this is still the TV cut that they play or not had additional scenes starring uh, Danny DeVito and Brooke Adams as the owners of the hot dog stand that is down the street. And they're going through their own little side story. And you kind of briefly see them like when TC runs into the phone booth where he finally wins the concert tickets. That's Brooke Adams' character that he's pushing past because she was making a call that was tying into their plot. Oh, okay. God, I'm trying to even remember what it was in the script, what their plot was. They weren't that (laughs) interesting, so I could see why they were cut. (laughs) (laughs) And there are apparently a few scenes on YouTube. I kind of forgot to watch them before we <laughs> did this but <laughs> some of their scenes are up on youtube and i might stick them in the production notes yeah i'd be interested just because it is danny devito but i don't know which surprised me because it was supposed to be this studly young italian couple in their 20s <laughs> 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 and they get danny devito and brooke adams <laughs> <laughs> yeah and brooke adams was surprising brooke adams by the way if you don't know is tony shalhoub's wife mm. oh, okay she was the star of the 1970s invasion of the body snatchers oh, okay and then of course danny devito you might not have heard of him no <laughs> but yeah that was interesting finding out wait danny devito was playing this character i okay <laughs> yeah i saw him in the background like when the tim thomerson when he's walking up to the car wash office oh i didn't even notice him okay yeah you can see him in the background in that scene i didn't realize it was him yeah when tim thomerson's on screen my eyes are on tim thomerson. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> i understand i understand but i mean just overall i just really like how the film is put together i think the editing the way it's shot is really nice I did also want to just mention as we go through this series, because Joel Schumacher was a costume designer, I do always want to just take a moment to give a shout out to whoever did the costumes. Mm. And this one, the costume designer is Daniel Paredes, who also was the costume designer on Sparkle. Oh, okay. And will also be doing Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill. Not many credits to his name. He actually passed away in 1993. But two of his other big films that he's known for, the 1980s remake of Cat People, (laughs) which is interesting given that the characters are pretty much naked for half that movie. Right. And the wonderful 80s sci-fi fantasy schlocktastic, The Ice Pirates. Oh, (laughs) wow. Anyways, any final thoughts on Car Wash before I get into the release? Like I said, I can't recommend it, but I did actually appreciate just seeing so many like African-American comedy legends and actors early on in their careers. I thought that was cool. It does actually make me want to watch some old 70s films. That's an era I really just haven't watched a whole lot of. It's an enjoyable film, but not something I'm ever going to watch again, probably. Mm. I don't know. It's just weird because it's like, it's not that I disliked this movie. It's just that I guess I wanted a little bit more from it. Like maybe a little bit more of that drama mixed in in those early parts really would have gone a long way in helping the flow of this a little bit more. It's got some fun stuff. It's just ultimately feels a little, I guess, disjointed to me overall. I still really enjoyed it. I actually watched it with a friend. We were both just really getting into it. I actually felt compelled to go and watch it again that same night afterwards. And I really liked how Joel wrote this movie. I liked how he did the characters and the kind of day in the life scenario and bouncing all these little bits and vignettes around each other. I thought Michael Schultz directed it really well. I thought the cast held together right. I have some of the little quibbles. Like, again, I don't think Joel is the strongest at writing relationships. Mm -hmm. I think there's a few of the dramatic bits that didn't quite pay off as well as they could because you lost some of the buildup to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, I still think that ending is great. I think that actually kind of holds the whole thing together and gives it a good anchor. 
I liked where all these people were coming from. I liked how they all bounced off each other. Again, characters like Lindy are, again, astonishing that they got away with something like that at the time. Right. And even just characters like Lonnie. I really enjoyed spending this day with these people. Even though they're not the best people, they're messy people, they got messed up lives. But again, these are the people I work with every day. This is my life now. <laughs> <laughs> I really related to this movie. And again, it's like a job like this is a lot like high school. You don't get to choose who you're in class with. You just kind of have to make the best of who you're with. It's cool seeing the relationships, the friendships and enmities and conflicts and bonding that all come from just throwing a bunch of people in a place where you're kind of stuck with whoever you're with and you have to get through the day with them. I like that. And this has me really, really curious to see what these Joel Schumacher scripted ensemble pieces are going to be like when he starts directing them. Because mm. again, we're going to get to that soon with Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill. Mm -hmm. JD, you're going to be back when we cover DC Cab. Yeah. Which again, happened directly as a result of this movie. They wanted to make another car wash. <laughs> I'm going to be curious to see how Joel building a group of people is going to continue to work as he becomes the one who's directing them. And I know mm -hmm. Virginia Hill was not the best first foot forward as a director for him. So I'm going to be curious to see how he handles it. Yeah. Again, we're still like six years before where Box Office Mojo covers releases of films. And I have no info on what the budget for this film was or the box office. It was interesting how it's a film that it very much got a wide release in urban communities. But outside of that, it still had very limited releases. I know it was a successful film. It still did well, but there are parts of the country where it like almost never got released. Like I asked my dad, who was a film critic back in the 70s in Minnesota, Car Wash was released in one theater in Minnesota, in the middle of Minneapolis. Hmm. And that's it. Whereas I have some co-workers who are older black men who are in their 60s, who were in Chicago when the film came out, and they were like, it was the biggest hit in town. We went and saw it every night for a week, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I asked, so what was it like when Car Wash came out? They just started singing the song and quoting the <laughs> lines. And it was a big, important film at the time in that community. And to a degree, it did apparently have some level of crossover success. And Roger Ebert even gave it a glowing review. But it still had a limited degree of release, and apparently it then became a big hit on TV and video. It's a film that has had some lasting success, and I know even like when Ice Cube was doing Friday at Barbershop, he was trying mm. to do a throwback to Car Wash, which was always one of his favorite movies. Makes sense. I was going to say that it kind of reminds me a bit of Clerks in some mm. ways. Mm. Like, it's obviously a much pared down cast, but just the day in the life of wacky adventures happening around a fixed location, people mm -hmm. doing their jobs, and even the ending kind of reminds me of the deleted ending for Clerks, which is where Dante got shot by somebody doing a robbery of the store. God, if Abdullah had shot Lonnie and just gone off with the money, it wouldn't have worked as an ending. No, no. no. And that's, I'm glad they took that out of Clerks because yeah. it doesn't work in there either. Right. But it's just funny because that's, you know, going back to how <laughs> Sparkle was originally supposed to end. Mm. I like that it had that tension, but then ultimately they released and connected. This wouldn't have worked if you had gone full tragedy. No. Yeah, that is interesting to bring up Clerks, which is very much of this ilk. I mean, I think this is very much building off of Jacques Tati was a French director who almost all of his films are just day in the life in a location to the point where characters aren't even named. There's almost no dialogue beyond just general chatter as people are floating in and out of things. And yet it's just like, here's an inn. Here's a day in the life at that inn. His are much more larger and sprawling and opulent because it like, goes through hundreds of people passing through a place. I'm always kind of fascinated by that. Let's just kind of root into a location and see what happens here for a day. And again, this is also very much going on what Robert Altman was like with like MASH and Nashville. Of Let's just hunker down in a place and explore the people who are here. And I guess like to me, yeah, like it makes more sense in a TV show to really get to know the people than in a film. See, but I almost prefer that in a film length because that's almost more reflective of reality where you go to a garage and a mechanic shop, you're only getting a brief glimpse into the people who are there. If you even pay attention for it. Well, but to do the comparisons like you were doing, like at your work, I mean, you're with those people every day. Yeah. You've come to know all of those different that's people really well. And I feel like that's what it is. Like the more you get to know these characters, the more you can understand their perspectives a little better. Whereas an hour and a half or give or take doesn't always necessarily give you that depending on the size of the cast. See, and I feel I got everything I needed from this. See, and I think it would have worked a little bit better if they had cut the cast size by maybe a third. Mm hmm. If we had gotten rid of like Chuko and Goody and Scruggs and some of these other characters that they're not necessarily bad presences, but they don't add a whole lot. Right. We could have spent just a 
little bit more time with some of these other characters, I would have probably attached to him a lot more. Mm -hmm. And I think I would have been a little bit more satisfied. I mean, you almost could have combined those with Floyd and Lloyd, Mm -hmm. where both Floyd and Lloyd are both having issues with their significant others. That's still playing out through the day as they're trying to settle the old arguments and all that stuff. And one of them Mm -hmm. reconnects and the other's left hanging. Right. I could see that, but I also, again, didn't mind it because I like the size of everything. I like that there's so many people here that you're not going to learn more about their lives because you don't need to. Because even when I'm working with these people, I don't really know anything about the lives of the people I work with. I only just get these little snippets here and there. (laughs) I mean, it's like, how many people do you work with do you actually sit down and tell your entire life story to? Well, no, of course not. You know, every now and then it's like you connect over something. But for the most part, you're just getting through the day, tossing around banter, you know, hey, you want to go get a sandwich during lunch, you know, that kind of thing. You're not going to learn more than what you're given here. I don't know my coworkers really any better than I know these characters. (laughs) And I've been working with them for six months. There's a couple I know better, but most of the people I work with, I wouldn't call friends. They're coworkers. Well, sure. Most of these people aren't even friends. They're coworkers. <laughs> they don't do anything together outside of the day. Right. I guess I just, I, I enjoyed seeing it from that angle. I'm not saying you're not allowed to. I know. It's fine. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I do know just a a little bit about the release. I don't have box office, I don't have budget, but just kind of looking at some of the other stuff that came out around the time. This came out in October 22nd of 1976, a perfect Halloween movie. (laughs) It came out up against Burnt Offerings, which was the big haunted house movie of the time. Nothing else really big around that time. I'm sure there were some other things that came out that month, but Wikipedia is just kind of like, here's the highlights. A couple weeks later, November 3rd, is when Carrie came out. Okay. So that would have been a massive success. And also in November was Network, which was like the big Oscar movie of the time. Mm. And then at the beginning of December, Rocky. <laughs> that was a pretty big few months there, just between Carrie, Network, and Rocky. Mm-hmm. Those are three big films mm-hmm. to go up against. But I can still see how Car Wash still could have done well in the midst of that because it's kind of different. It's for anyone who doesn't connect with those. And again, playing to the communities that it does. Exactly, yeah. Not even specifically the black communities, but the working communities. Because again, this was kind of a crossover film. Right. Yeah, I don't think they'd intend for it to be like a huge blockbuster style hit. But right, for the communities and everything, I think that makes sense that it built a little bit of a cult following Mm -hmm. in certain areas. It did continue playing in theaters for quite some time. It's like theaters, but you know, it still had a pretty Mm -hmm. lengthy run. Because again, this was the era where if a film built a cult following, it could still stick in theaters for like two to three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much all I've got on Car Wash. Our next episode, we're going to have another Joel Schumacher writing a movie, another prominent black culture movie, The Wiz. I'm looking forward to that. I haven't actually seen it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. (laughs) I haven't seen it since I was a kid. It's been a while. And that's going to be interesting because I not only have the film, but I got the original play script Mm. and I've got Joel's screenplay and I've got that live one that they just did a couple years ago on TV. I'm going to be curious to kind of compare and contrast everything. So I've got a lot to go through. So thank you for joining us, JD. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm sure we'll never do a podcast with you again. Um, well, you've <laughs> already said I was going to be on DC Cab, but... Um... <laughs> retcon, retcon. Oh, well, okay. great. Now I don't exist. <laughs> and Angie, thank you for joining me as always. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, JD, for coming. And we'll be back next month for another episode of Shumacast. Good night. Good night. Bye. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. 